Matthew chapter number 3, we'll begin reading of verse number 1. The Bible says, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Esaias, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and mild honey. Doesn't sound like a pretty boy, does he? Uh, doesn't have skinny jeans on, does he? Huh? Uh, it goes on, verse number 5, Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits, meet for repentance, and think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father, for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees, therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that it cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat unto the garner, and he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We thank you for the goodness of God. Thank you, Lord, again for the good singing, the good testimonies, and, Lord, for your good grace. Lord, we'd all be in a mess had you not come to where we were and delivered us. And Lord, we are thankful we're not in the horrible pit tonight. We're thankful on this path called straight headed to heaven. Now, I pray for the next few minutes that, Lord, you would uh, use this unworthy vessel and, God, you deliver the message that you put in my heart. Put a watch guard about my lips. Help me not to say anything contrary to the word or will of God. But bless your people, energize them in the things of God, enlighten their minds. Uh, God, give them a mind to work and a mind to seek after God and to do his will. Now, Father, I pray for Miss Crystal, you touch her. I pray, Father, for Brother Eddie and the others that are sick that we mentioned, touch them. Be with those that are providentially hindered. God, sit down amongst us and help us now. We'll thank you for it, for it's in the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus, we ask it all. Amen and amen. I want you to notice a few things in these verses about the text. The first thing I want you to notice is the ministry of John the Baptist. We find in verse number one, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Notice he didn't come as a motivational speaker. He didn't come as a politician. He didn't come uh, for man's approval. He came preaching what thus saith the Lord. The Lord had prepared him in the wilderness, uh, and he comes out preaching uh, with God in his soul. Uh, we find not only the ministry of John the Baptist, but notice the methods of John the Baptist. Uh, in verse number 4, in this uh, same John uh, had his raiment of camel's hair and leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locust and wild honey. Then went out to him, Jerusalem, uh, and all Judea and all the region round about and were baptized of him in Jordan confessing their sins. Uh, let me say this, that John did not live under the age of grace like we do today. Uh, John lived under the law, uh, but he was the forerunner to Christ. Uh, he was the one that would bridge the gap uh, from what they had known from Moses uh, all to now Jesus Christ coming on the scene. Uh, and John's method uh, was to baptize them uh, for remission of sins. C can I say there is no uh, regenerational baptism tonight uh, as far as water baptism. Uh, if you're lost and you get baptized, you'll just be a wet sinner. You're not uh, going to heaven because you got baptized. Uh, but that day, uh, it was a sign that they had confessed their sins and repented toward Towards God, uh, therefore they were baptized. We see his ministry, we see his method, uh, but notice his message. Uh, look 
Luke, if you will, uh, 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 he preaches penance uh, or repentance. Verse number two, repent ye. Repentance is a change of mind and change of heart uh, from the direction you've been headed towards God. Uh, uh, you're turning from your way to God. Uh, thanks be unto God for those that understand you've got to repent to be saved. Uh, you've got to turn from your life uh, to Christ. Uh, turn from your sin to the Savior. Uh, turn and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ uh, and thou shalt be saved. Uh, he not only preached uh, uh, penance or repentance, he also warns to be prepared. Look at verse number four. Uh, 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 or verse number three he said, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Uh, make his path straight. Uh, he was uh, uh, preaching to be prepared. The Lord was coming uh, at Jesus' first coming. Uh, I've got news for you. We need to be uh, preaching uh, uh, be ye prepared. Uh, uh, break up your fallow ground. The Lord's on his way. He's coming. Could come today, my dear friends. Uh, Notice he also exhorts to prove yourself. Look at verse number 7. Uh, uh, when uh, many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptizing, look what he says to them. This is a soft-spoken preacher. He said unto them, old generation of vipers. He called them a bunch of snakes. I'm talking about the lawyers and the religious leaders of his day. He said, you're a bunch of vipers. Uh, you're a bunch of snakes. Uh, he said, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Now look at verse number 8. Bring forth therefore fruits meet uh, for repentance. Can I say, uh, repentance has always brought a change. If you get right with God, there'll be fruit in your life. And the same as today, yeah, somebody that runs down an aisle and, and says they got saved, but they don't come back to church, uh, they never desire the things of God, uh, uh, they never uh, uh, get involved and live for Christ. I want to tell you something, they didn't get what I got. Uh, when Jesus saved me, he put something in me to desire the things of God. Uh, I haven't always been what I should be, but thanks be unto God, I'm not what I used to be. Uh, been saved by the good grace of God. Uh, so we see that he, say, he exhorts them to prove yourself. Listen, somebody come over with a bumper sticker back in the 70s. said, if you was tried for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Hmm? Huh? Well, I got real sober on that. Huh? Coming to church, that, that's, just, that's the bare minimum. That's just getting started. And there ought to be fruit in your life that you know Jesus. We see that he exhorts to prove yourself, but he also makes a profession. Look what he says in verse number 11. I indeed baptize you with water under repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I. Whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor uh, and gather his wheat into the garner, and he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Now, John admits some things. Now, listen, we're not talking about just an average run-of-the-mill Christian. John was somebody far better than anybody in this building. Matter of fact, Jesus said, never was a man born of woman better than John the Baptist. I've heard people say, the Apostle Paul is the greatest person to walk on the earth outside of the Lord Jesus. That's what Jesus said. Jesus said, John the Baptist. I mean, this was a man of high character towards God. You've got to put this man in the category with Job. I mean, these guys are shoot evil. They love God. I mean, you could not touch their life. But John's about ready to make an important profession. He says this, he admits that he's lesser than Jesus. Look at verse 11. He said, the one who cometh after me is mightier than I. Now can I say, Jesus goes on to preach to the Pharisees, what did you go out to see when you went out to see John? He said, a prophet and a prophet indeed. I mean, John was well respected from everybody uh, uh, from Herod down. They respected John. But John's saying, hey, you got your eyes on me. Don't look at me. He said, there's one mightier than I. Hmm? He admits he's lesser than Jesus. He also admits that he's limited when compared to Jesus. Look what he says. Uh, he said, I indeed baptize you with water under repentance. But then he goes on to say, yeah, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. He said, what I have is just limited compared to what he's got. What he has is eternal. Hmm? 
And then he admits that Jesus is Lord. Look at verse number 12. Whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat unto the garner, and he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. In verse number 12, he said, he's Lord. He's the one that's in control of everybody and everybody trusting in God or rejecting God. Now, I, I'm interested in verse 11. He said, I indeed baptize you with water under repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than the eye whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Can I say that when you got born again, you got baptized by the Holy Ghost. He sealed you unto the day of redemption. Matter of fact, when you called on the Lord, he did a supernatural, unseen, as Brother Ron meant it in his uh, uh, testimony, he did a miracle. The Holy Ghost cut away the stony part of your flesh and he moved in and he sealed it up uh, and that inward man, your soul, sinneth no more after he sealed it. Now our flesh sins, but the Holy Ghost moved in your life. Jesus said it was must needs for him to go away that the comforter could come. And the Holy Ghost is the one that lives in us and that uh, 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 leads us and guides us into all truth uh, and brings unto our remembrance everything the Lord has said. Uh, the Holy Ghost is the one who convicts us even before we sin. Uh, the Holy Ghost uh, is in our lives uh, and we're in the Lord because of the Holy Ghost. And my dear friends, when you got saved, you got baptized by the Holy Ghost. Everybody's saved got the Holy Ghost in them. Hmm? And can I say there's no second blessing. You got all the Holy Ghost you're ever going to get when you got saved. Now, uh, Paul exhorted, said, be ye filled with the Holy Ghost. What's he exhorting us to do? Just be. Be filled with the Holy Ghost. In other words, empty yourself of self and all the world and just let the Holy Ghost direct you. But you got all the Holy Ghost you're ever going to get when you got saved. So when you got saved, we got baptized by the Holy Ghost. But my question is, he said, He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Now, you know I am blessed. God has enlarged my coast, and the Lord has allowed me to, to preach meetings and, and travel and, and do all that. And, and I've got one coming up. I'm going to somewhere in Alabama I've never heard of. I've never even met the preacher uh, but they call and book me, come preach. I'm going there in a couple of weeks and go, go preach for them. And, and I'm already nervous. I don't know nobody. And this is going to be a weird situation because they don't know me, you know. So it's going to be rough. Uh, but, hey, uh, it's a privilege to go and preach. But I'll say this. In my travels, I see a lot of folks that are saved. I see a lot of folks that love God. A lot of folks that are faithful. What I don't see is the fire. Matter of fact, if there had been one more verse on I'll fly away, I was shutting it down. Because you all looked like you wasn't flying away. You looked like you wanted to stay. That song got so draggy that I was about ready to fall asleep over there playing it. I hadn't got to play the bass in months. And Brother Naren, because the school couldn't be here tonight, uh, had to go and do some kind of thing uh, uh, down in Louisville. And they picked him up. And he was apologizing to him this morning. Felt bad he's going to miss and all that. And I'm thinking, uh, hey, Naren's not here. I get to play the bass. What a blessing. I ain't got to play it months. I get up there. Oh, I fly away. One of my favorites. Are, uh, fly away. Oh, glory. There was no fire in that song. Huh? All just dragging along. When you're on fire, you don't drag. Huh? When you're on fire, you got the boot scooting boogie going on. Huh? That's my question. Where's the fire? I'm not questioning your salvation. I'm not questioning your sincerity. I'm not questioning your love for God. I'm not questioning your faithfulness. I'm not questioning your Bible reading and your praying. What I'm questioning is, in 2024, does anybody have the fire of God on them? Amen. So for a little while tonight, I want to preach on fire from God. Because the fire I'm talking about, you can't, you can't muster it up. It's heaven sent. Huh? There's some things that I, 
uh, that God gave me as I, you know, He just dealt with me on this this week. And some things I got to thinking about on this fire from God. Can I say, first of all, it's developed through trials. Peter said in 1 Peter 1, 6, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, uh, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, uh, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Uh, can I say that the fire from God is developed through trials? Uh, now, uh, I don't need to ask you to raise your hand if you're, if you're going through something or if you're facing a trial. Uh, if you know somebody facing a trial, uh, hey, we're always either in a storm, just coming out of a storm, or we're facing a storm. Uh, it's not the fact that you have trials. Uh, 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 the fire is developed through the trial. Uh, did you hear what Peter said? Though, he try, though it be tried with fire, might be found under the praise, uh, honor, and glory of the appearing of Jesus Christ. Uh, when God allows a trial to come in your life, it is for His glory. Uh, and when you're going through the fire, and you're going through the trial, you're going through the heartaches, uh, God is trying to develop in you the fire of God uh, that others can see. Uh, though you're burning, you're not consumed. Uh, though that uh, uh, you're under the load, the load does not control you. Uh, he's trying to develop us uh, through the trials uh, uh, to praise God for the trial uh, to live through for God through the trial uh, uh, to give God glory while we're in the trial uh, the trial develops fire from God in us uh, but too many people brother Rod when we're going through the trial what we do is we complain Amen. if we're not complaining brother Peter what we're doing is we're hitting the altar asking God to remove the trial the trials, what's going to bring the fire? We're asking God to quench the very thing that we need. Right. Or we blame God for the trial. Hmm? Now, sometimes, Brother Clint, I have seen this when things start to go wrong, then all of a sudden somebody's been out of church, wants to get in church. Like they're going to merit God's favor to get them out of the trial. That's not a trial to bring fire. That's a trial to bring conviction. Amen. Hmm. Now I'm talking about faithful folks. Where's the fire? Hmm? Where's your zeal for God? Where's that thing that other people see in you and say, boy, I want what they got. Right. I looked around at you tonight and I'm thinking, God, I'm glad I don't have anything this crowd's got. Uh, uh, everybody looks sick and peaked and wear, worn out. We're only in church. Uh, can I say that the fire of God is developed through trials? Job said in Job 23.10, But he knoweth the way that I take, and when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. How come that's not our attitude? We're going through a trial. We, we fall all apart. Oh, 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 woe is me. Job had everything in the world go against him, and he says, God knows what the way I take. I don't know why I'm going through this, but when he's done trying me, I'm going to come out looking like gold. Amen. We don't approach trials that way because we got a reverse thinking. We have bought into the humanistic teachings of the world and the Joe Osteen crowd to think that God's got something better for us uh, and everything in this world is brought about so we can live a prosperous life. You know the most prosperous life you can ever live is the fire of God in your soul. Because mm -mm. that means you're close to God. Not only is the fire of God developed through trials, but it also destroys earthly treasures. Here's why a lot of people don't have fire, Brother Ron. They're too attached to stuff. Job 1.16, while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God has fallen from heaven, had burned up the sheep and the servants, consumed them, and I only escaped alone to tell thee. Job got four messages that day. He lost all his flocks, lost his finances, lost his family, lost all in one day. But it did not deter Job from living for God. Can I say 
When the fire of God hits you, it'll destroy those things that you're attracted to. Unless that thing is Jesus. Amen. Let me give you a little speak from experience. But I, you may not know this about me. Do you know this about me? I love Corvettes. Yeah. Now, 63 because of the split windows of one year on. But if I had my drive, if, if push come to shove, 67 with that 427 four speed. Yeah. Uh, there's something about fiberglass and a big motor. Uh, grew up loving Corvettes. Four, four houses down from us, a guy had a 65 and he had a custom paint job on it, and I saw it every day from the time I was four till I was 18. Matter of fact, Rod, I made the statement I'd have one by the time I was 25. I bought one at 22 and paid cash for it. I had to have a car. I loved it. Matter of fact, God blessed me to have everything I said I'd always want. Except the baseball career. Shorter was gone. But I had everything. But I was miserable. Didn't know I was miserable, but I was miserable. And then a miraculous thing happened. I got to a point I couldn't get enough of God. Matter of fact, I... At one point, over a 50-day period, I'd been in there about 70 services. If I heard of a revival meeting, Brother Phil, within 100 miles, I was going. I just couldn't get enough of preaching. I couldn't get enough of good singing. I couldn't get enough just being around the uh, uh, things of God. And I'll never forget, uh, in September of 87, uh, Dwight Kaufman was preaching up uh, in Loveland for Brother Joe Greer, and he preached every night on John 3, 16. I was there every night but Wednesday night. I was in my home church, uh, and it was in that meeting God began to deal with me about surrendering to preach. But long before that, uh, God was doing something, Brother Thad, in my soul, and the things that I always thought I wanted, they weren't important to me anymore. Matter of fact, there was a young man getting ready to go into the Air Force, my granddaddy's church, and I mean, every time service was over, we'd come out of church, and he'd sit there lusting on my Corvette. I mean, he was, he was, he was all but licking the thing. Uh, he loved it. And he constantly was talking to me about that Corvette. Well, God got to doing so much in my life that Corvette became a burden. It didn't help that it was pushing 576 horsepower and was getting seven miles to the gallon. That didn't help. I'm talking highway. But it just didn't mean anything anymore. Two weeks before that boy went to Air Force, I don't even know what compelled me. I guess it was just the Lord. I just picked up the phone. I called him and said, how much money you got? He said, I got $3,500. Well, that's a $12,000 car. I said, come and get it. And I sold him that car for $3,500 because what I, I did not know then, what I know now is when the fire of God is developing in you and working on you, the things that you treasured, he destroys. Amen. That car didn't mean anything to me anymore. Those things I thought I'd always want, they didn't mean anything to me anymore. Matter of fact, I had an uncle, Preston, had a 76 Maverick with a V6 and air conditioning. He said, I'll give you that for 600 bucks. You know, I just sold 3,500 bucks. I bought it for 600 bucks and drove that thing. It got a lot better gas mileage. And that's how I know Miss Nett liked me. She never got to see the first Corvette. All she got to do was hear the Corvette. But she'd go places with me in that Maverick. What a blessing. I knew she liked me because that was the ugliest car God ever made. And it's a blessing. Every time I preach for Brother Jerry Allen, we go right around the corner just a half mile from his church. There's a yellow maverick sitting there. I said, you want me to go see if he'll sell that? No, no. She hated that car. What I'm trying to say is when the fire of God begins to work in your life, uh, all the attractions of the world and the treasures you've attained, uh, they lose their significance. They lose their importance. Uh, uh, even if you don't understand it, the only thing that is important is Him. The fire of God is developed through trials that will destroy your earthly treasures, but it's also designed to impart trust. God puts you on fire so you'll learn to trust Him. 
Job said in Job 1.20, Then Job rose and ran his mantle, shaved his head, uh, fell down on the ground and worshipped, said, Naked came out of my mother's womb, and naked I shall return thither. The Lord gave, the Lord had taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job 13.15, he said, Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him, uh, but I will maintain mine own ways before him. Uh, 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 when God puts a fire on us, uh, it's not uh, designed to make us bitter. It's not designed to push us away. It's designed for us to trust Him more and to realize He's got it all under control. You think those three Hebrews wanted to go into the fiery furnace? No. But they went in trusting God and they come out with more trust in God. Fire's always designed to impart trust. Now listen to me. Fire always detours everything that it, that it touches. It always deforms everything that it touches. You ever been on fire? It don't look like it did before the fire. Mm. Can I say, the fire God falls on you, you'll start looking different, you'll start acting different, you'll be different. You'll worship different, everything about you will be different because the fire detours everything it touches. Now listen to me. The fire of God is imputed and burns in our lives through several things. Say, Brother Doug, how can I get on fire for God? I'm fixing to give it to you. What good would it have been for me to tell you all that and not tell you how to get it? I've heard a lot of preaching. Boy, they tell us what, is, what we need, but they don't tell us how to get it. Huh? It'd be like Brother Tommy telling me about the best ice cream in town not telling me where it's at because he wants to hoard it all up for himself because he's selfish. Share and share alike, bro. Uh, so how is the fire of God imputed unto us? How does it burn in our lives? Well, it begins with the promises of God. You'll never have the fire of God apart from the Word of God. Listen to me now. Jeremiah said, uh, Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name, but his word was in mine heart uh, as a burning fire shut up in my bone, and I was weary and forbearing, and I could not stay. Uh, what happened? The word of God was in him, and that had developed a fire. Uh, even when he wanted to quit, even when he didn't want to speak God's name anymore, uh, he said, there was something burning on me. I could not stay silent. Uh, 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 the Bible says in Luke 24, uh, uh, those two disciples of Amazing, uh, they said this and they said one to another did, our, did not our heart burn within us uh, while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures uh, uh, the word of God will develop a fire in you that nothing else will uh, 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 listen uh, uh, there's something about this blessed old book uh, there's something about the truths and the precepts uh, and the promises contained therein uh, uh, the more you're in the book the more the book gets in you my my dear friends, uh, now listen, there is no fire but uh, by us merely taking in the Word of God. You can sit under preaching until the cows come home, but if you don't learn to apply it and you don't dive into the Word, you'll never get on fire. Hmm? It's not about them imputing it to me or, or putting it in me or me putting it on. It's about me diving into it. That's what changes things. You know why a lot of people aren't on fire? They don't spend time to book. Amen. Spend time to book, it'll change you. It'll transform you. It'll grow your faith. So then faith comes by here and here by the Word of God. But the Word of God is where the fire starts getting kindled. Can I say it's not only imputed unto us and burns in our lives through the Word of God or the promises of God, but it also comes through the presence of God in our lives. When Moses came down off the mountain, his face shone because he'd been close to God. The closer we get to God, the more it's seen on us. When we drift away from God, it's seen on us too. Now, when we've not been close to God, we've not been walking with God, and God's presence not been in our lives, we sing, I'll fly away, oh glory. But when God set a fire in your soul, it's, I'll fly away, oh glory. Clint's arm to be going this. You know what his arm was doing tonight? I told Brother Daniel, I said, if that kind of song got any drag, you're out of died. 
Uh, why? We didn't have any fire. It comes by the presence of God in our lives. Deuteronomy 5.24 says, And ye said, Behold, the Lord our God hath showed us His glory and His greatness, uh, and we have heard His voice out of the midst of the fire, uh, and we have seen Him this day, that God doth talk with man, and He liveth. Uh, there's just something about the presence of God. It changes your thinking. Uh, it changes your direction. It changes your desires. Uh, uh, listen, uh, Hebrews 12.29, we, we know it says, For our God is a consuming fire, uh, and when you get close to him the fire rub off on you uh, can I say the fire of God is not earned but experienced nobody merits God's favor enough to have the fire of God it's something he does John said he'll baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire where's the fire something God does for us you can't earn it it's experienced can I say this the fire of God seeks no acclaim just access it always amazes me how people want to stand up and tell what they've done every time they do that there's no fire God's not impressed with what we do the Holy Ghost isn't looking for a claim from you he's wanting access to your heart huh? can I say this the fire of God doesn't need vilification it's just easily viewed God doesn't need a license, nor does He need to give you an explanation. He doesn't need vilification that that was God. All the fire of God is for is to be viewed in our lives so others would be attracted to what set us on fire. Hey, it don't matter if it's just smoldering, if it's a one-alarm fire or a five-alarm fire people take notice of something burning you know how we can impact this community get on fire for God they'll want to come out and see what's burning they'll take note they won't be able to drive by 60 miles an hour hit the roundabout and almost hit brother Ed and Miss Kay they'll say something's on fire better slow down something's burning down there hmm how do we get the fire of God, Brother Doug? You know, it's found in the promises of God. It's found in the presence of God in our lives. But can I say, the fire, fire of God is imputed unto us through prayer. In James 5, 16, you know, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. It didn't say a man that prays. It says the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And he goes on to describe Elijah. Elijah prayed that it wouldn't rain. It didn't rain for three and a half years until Elijah prayed for it to rain again. Was Elijah a superman? No, he was just close to God. Hmm? We know in 1 Kings 18, uh, he prayed down fire from heaven. He says, Hear, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the waters in the trench. It comes from having a true and impactful prayer life. I want you to do inventory. How much do you talk to God in prayer? Now I want you to take that and put it on the same playing field with how much do you spend time on your phone? How much do you spend time watching TV? How much do you spend time reading the newspaper? Spend time doing... And you start all of a sudden seeing you spend more time doing this than you do praying. And that's why there's no fire. Prayer is where the power comes from. No prayer, no fire. And I'm talking about fervent prayer. I'm talking about that kind where you shut everything else out and you tune in to God through prayer. True fervent prayer is when you run out of words and you run into Him. I read a quote this, this week. It says, You can tell if a man's been with God when he stands behind the pulpit by his prayer life hmm. today we have orators used to we had preachers hmm. it cringes when I'm invited somewhere to pray and they 
they're praying for the speaker tonight. I'm thinking, I am not a speaker. Uh, I can't even stutter most of the time, let alone speak. But I hope to be a preacher. I hope to have a touch of God in my life. It's going to say fire is imputed by the promises of God, the presence of God in our lives, prayer. You see, all these things take time. They take effort. They take concentration. And the problem is we stay so busy and we stay so involved in everything else that we just rush in the church, rush out, and we wonder why there wasn't any fire. Because we didn't bring any with us. Can I say that the fire is imputed unto us, it burns within us through publishing. You remember when Jesus would do something and he would tell them not to say anything about it and then they published it everywhere? Well, he tells us to publish the gospel and we don't tell anybody. He said in Acts 1.8, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. You know why the power of God is to be in our lives uh, and the fire of God is to show up in our lives? It is not so we can boast to how great a Christian we are. The Holy Ghost was given in power and the fire has come upon us when we witness that we can be an effective, impactful witness for God. You want the fire of God? Start telling people about Jesus. You say, well, I don't know what to say. Well, just tell them how you got saved. Just start inviting them to church. Say, I want you to come out to church. The Lord might help you down here at the church house. The more we witness, the more God will start showing up in our life. Then I thought of this lastly. The fire of God is imputed unto us when we fulfill the will of God and the purpose of God in our lives. God's got a perfect will for every one of us. And when we are faithful to that will, whatever His desire for our lives, obedience starts bringing that fire into our lives. Numbers 25, 11, the Bible says, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, hath turned my wrath away from the children of Israel while he was zealous for my sake among them, that I, may, that I consume not the children of Israel in my jealousy. God was going to consume Israel. But there was one guy named Phineas, And Phineas had zeal for God and for the things of God. And because of one man, God didn't destroy the nation. I wonder what God would do for America if just one person truly got on fire for God. I wonder what God would do for America if one church got on fire for God. Hmm? The world has yet to see one church totally sold out for the cause of Christ. I've often said I'd like to be that church. Uh, but it starts within me and it starts within you. Let me ask you something. Where's the fire? See, too many want the fire, Brother Ron, through mechanics. No, fire comes through the presence of God, spending time with Him, being obedient to Him, and seeking Him more than anything else. And when He becomes your desire, He'll set you on fire. I was thinking, Brother Jeffrey's preaching revival for Brother Wheeler this week, and I was thinking about being up at Brother Wheeler's, and, and, and I'll never forget, they, they sang that song to death, Set my soul on fire, Lord. Set my soul on fire. That'll be our desire. Amen. That God sets us on fire for His honor and for His glory. Now listen, it may come with trials. It definitely changes everything it touches. It comes at a cost. It might cost you your treasures. But oh, it's worth it when somebody comes up and says, I want what you got. There's something about you that I don't have. Listen. People in this world 
are groping in the darkness. They're running to religion. They're running to philosophies. They're running to politicians. They're running to everything, looking for some help and some hope. Everywhere they've turned, there's not been any help. And all the church that they've ever known has either been rules or it's been powerless. And what they need to see is a crowd that's just on fire for Jesus. I say, I haven't seen that before. I'm going to look into that. Maybe that's what I'm looking for. Here's the key. You can't set yourself on fire. It takes God. But he's willing to if you're willing to pay the price. Now, can I say a message like this, the answer doesn't come and rush into the altar. But that's a good start. It comes from spending the time in his word, in prayer, walking in his presence, seeking to fulfill his will for your life, and being a witness for him. You start doing those things on a regular basis, and before long, you're going to be on fire. We've got a meeting starting tomorrow. And hopefully, it gives us a greater burden for sinners. And then in about a month, we've got Brother Cody and Brother Travis coming, and hopefully we're on fire before they get here. If we're on fire before they get here, there's no telling what happened that week. Say, preacher, why are you preaching like this? Because we need the fire of God. Look around at how many's not even here. Amen. You wouldn't believe some of the lame excuses that people offer for not coming to church. And I say it's not because they don't, they're not saved. It's just because they've gotten so weak spiritually that they don't know the difference between coming and missing. But if every time we come in here the fire of God fell, they'd know a difference. Because whatever's keeping them away, that won't give them what the fire of God will give them. But them young people back there need to see the fire of God. Unfortunately, some of them got, got a little more of it than some of us. God help us to start desiring that other thing that John the Baptist said the Lord would put on us. Well, I'm glad I got baptized by the Holy Ghost when I got saved. But I want the fire. Will you begin to desire the fire from God? Let's all stand. Brother Clint, come get a song of invitation. Miss Tina, come to the piano. While they're picking out a song, let's pray. Father, we bless you. Lord, forgive us of our complacency. Lord, it's easy to just go through the motions. And Lord, I know our flesh doesn't like to spend the time that it takes to be on fire, and we certainly don't want to give up the treasures that, Lord, we've worked so hard to amass. But I pray your presence and your desires would be developed into us so much that, Lord, the things of this world become strangely dim. And God, I pray that we truly would be set on fire for the Lord Jesus Christ. Not for our benefit, not for our uh, acclaim but Lord I pray that you would develop in us such a presence of you that others too would desire what we have God help us to take these steps to be set on fire and have the fire from God and God impact our community for your glory bless now this invitation speak to hearts some may need to come get in the altar and take the first step by admitting they need the fire of God so God, do a work. God, glorify your name. God, will bless you for it. For it's in Jesus' holy name we do pray. Amen. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.